What's up guys? Welcome in. This is Mr. Heinrich. We're looking at another AP Classroom progress check. This is unit two, number three for AP Classroom. Let's check it out. We have these different springs hanging from the ceiling and they all have different known spring constant values K. We have a mass down here that we don't know the mass of and we need to find it experimentally through a procedure that we develop. And this reiterates what I just said. You can read through that if you want. A, describe a procedure for collecting data that can be graphed to determine MB includes steps necessary to reduce experimental uncertainty. So the first thing I would realize is I have known K values. So these would be my independent variables. Now when I hang this mass on the, the little ring, it's going to stretch it down to a new length where the mass comes to rest, and we call that the equilibrium length. So what you would do is for each of these, you'd put the mass on there, let it stretch down to where it doesn't move anymore, and you'd measure the distance between this location and the bottom of that ring down here where the mass stretches it out. And you do that repeatedly because you want to reduce experimental uncertainty, and then you'd repeat that procedure on this one, on this one, and so on and so forth. So we would have known K values for each of the springs, and we would have a known distance X that the spring would stretch when coming to its equilibrium length with the spring and mass together. So I just explained all that stuff, but now let's formalize the process. I have three different steps written down for you, and the first of those is right here. Pause it if you need to to write it, but to reduce experimental uncertainty, we're going to do it multiple times for the first spring, and that's what this says. And then finally three, well, we have other springs, so we should repeat steps one and two for all the other springs. That's part A, all done. Again, pause the video if you need to write these steps out. All right, ready for part B? Describe how the data collected in part A could be graphed and how that graph would be analyzed to determine MB. So in my first section here, the equation we should be looking at is Hooke's Law, the restoring force is equal to the spring constant times the displacement from equilibrium. Notice I don't bother with the negative here. If you have more questions about that, please ask in the comments. I'll get into that with you. But let's realize real fast that the restoring force, the force that wants to take the spring back to where the spring was before the mass hung on it, the restoring force would be equal to the gravity. It's not the same force, but they're equal in magnitude because the block is just sitting there. So the downward force, Fg, is equivalent to the restoring force upward. Okay, so because of that, I said Fr equals Fg. Thus, we could replace Fr with gravity, and we'd say gravity is equal to K delta X. Now remember, we know some things. We know the K of each spring, and we know the displacement that each spring stretched, because that's what we did in part A. We measured that through a series of trials and took the average. From there, it's always our job, always, to take this equation and make it line up with slope is equal to rise over run. And that can be a challenge. Look at the equation as it's structured right now. Fg is equal to k delta x. Where's the mass? <laughs> well, the mass is embedded within Fg, agreed? Fg, gravity, is equal to mass times gravitational acceleration. So what I would do is make Fg my slope, and then from the slope you could easily divide by g, gravitational acceleration, to find the unknown mass. That's what I would do. But then that leaves us with an interesting issue. This is not a rise over a run. It's k times delta x, right? And that's not a division, that's a multiplication. So how do I force a division? How do I force a rise over a run? Well, I want k to be my rise, no doubt, okay? What I need to do is divide k by the inverse of delta x. Does that make sense? If I divide k by the inverse, meaning one over delta x, then it's the same thing as k times delta x. And I'm gonna show that now so if you look at this with me, you'd have k over 1 over, and I'll just use x to keep things simple here. It's a delta x. Well, all I'd have to do is multiply top and bottom by x, and I would clear that awkward-looking division there. 
and boom, boom, those would cross out. And look what you're left with. You're left with K times delta X, which is exactly what the original format is. So we're forcing a rise of K and a run of one over delta X by doing this. And so we're going to graph K on the vertical axis and one over delta X on the horizontal axis. And by doing this, we get a slope and that slope will be gravity. So we calculate the slope and remember, divide it by 9.8 G in order to obtain M sub B. Done with part B. Let's move on to part C. So this is a lot of verbiage. This is the graphical analysis part of this FRQ. Read this if you want to. I'm going to give you my version. So we have this two kilogram mass. It stays two kilograms the entire experiment. We put it on this spring and we stretch it where static friction can just hold it in place. Meaning if we went any further to the right here, the mass would rebound back to its original position. So we're finding out when static friction is maxed out. So we'll pull this out maybe to here, and then it'll just barely stay there. Then we would switch springs and do the same thing, and the same thing with all these different springs. And so we have a bunch of different data based on that idea. And they want to know, based on this correct equation that the students came up with, how can we basically create a graph where the slope will be equal to the coefficient of static friction? That's the nuts and bolts of this question. So let's look at C1. Indicate which measured or calculated quantity could be plotted on the horizontal axis to yield a linear graph whose slope can be used to calculate an experimental value coefficient of static friction, mu s, between the block and the surface, you may use the remaining columns in the table as needed to record any quantities, including units, that are not already in the table. Now the nice thing here is we already know mu s is going to be the slope of our graph. Done. Okay? And x is going to be the vertical axis or the y axis. So they've already taken out a lot of guesswork for us. Looking at this equation that students created, you can already see mu s up here in the numerator. Let's leave it there. We want to isolate this because we want that to be our slope. And we already see x is in the numerator also. So it's already set up to be our rise for the graph that we're about to create. So what do you have to do? Well, you got to create a run. You got to create a horizontal axis. Well, simply put, why don't we just take this big clunky thing, m naught g over k, and divide both sides by m naught g over k? Then this big ugly piece would be the quantity that would go on our horizontal axis. Make sense? I hope so. So right here, that's exactly what I put. But don't forget, we're supposed to actually create the plotted points we're about to put on the graph. So how do I create those plotted points? Well, m naught is 2, g is 9.8, 2 times 9.8, 19.6, and you will just divide 19.6 by the particular spring constant value over and over again to arrive at these plotted points that I'm about to show you. Boom, right there. So each one of these were obtained by doing 2 times 9.8 divided by these different spring constant values. But let's not forget, they want us to include units. So right here, I'm going to show you. Once again, you know we're graphing m naught g over k, but let's look at this weird unit. How did I get to that unit? Well, mass is kilograms, g is meters per second squared. So what's a kilogram meter per second squared? By definition, that is a newton. And what is the unit of k? Well, the unit of k is newtons per meter. So essentially what we have is newtons over newtons per meter. And if you look at this, it's actually pretty clean and concise what happens. These newtons cancel out. You'd be left with one over one over meters you would multiply top and bottom by meters real fast, like that. Are you telling me the unit is just meters? Yes, which makes a lot of sense. I want to explain to you why this unit essentially is meters. The coefficient of static friction that we are looking to get from the slope of our graph has no unit. So if our rise is in meters, our run has to be in meters also, so that you get meters over meters and you get a unitless number, which is exactly what we're going for. C2, this is gonna take a little time. 
But to make it faster, I have the table down here. These are my x-axis values, my corresponding y-axis values. But before I can plot those, I need to scale my x-axis. And I need to label my axes too. So reminding you, they're not giving us a choice here. The y-axis is going to be our distance in meters. And our axis down here is what we just discussed in the last part. If I'm topping out at an x value of 2.45, that's pretty close to 2.5. And I've messed around with this, and I'm telling you what I'm about to show you is the best scenario. It does make my graph stop somewhere around here, but it's still we're using most of the graph paper. And we should have enough space to get a good line of best fit so that we're getting good data points from that line in order to find the coefficient of static friction that we're looking for. All right, I'm going to reveal each one of these dots that I have pre-plotted. There's our first one. And make sure you see what I did here. I went 2.45, which is right about there in the x direction. And then I went up 0.74, and that's right where we're at because I didn't say this already, but the y-axis is counting by 0 0.02s. So 0 0.02, 0 0.04, 0 0.06, 0 0.08, 0 0.1 so on and so forth. Going to my next point, that looks pretty easy to follow with, right? We have a, oh, that's not my next point. That's my third point, but let's check that one out. We have 0.5 and we have 1.63, which is just a little bit past 1.6. Let's go back to that second plotted point. We have 1.96. And so I'm going to go right before the two. I'm going to go up, up, up. And yep, there it is right there to the 0.55 mark on the y-axis. And that's exactly what I showed. And just for the sake of time, I'm gonna show these next two and make sense of that with our graphing data right here. So it's not the best looking plot, but that's what we were given. And that's okay. No one experimental piece of data has to be that accurate. That's why we do several trials. But we do wanna average it out with a line of best fit. I already played around with this, so I know it's somewhere right around here. And it's going to do something like that, like that. And I feel like that's a pretty good average. Keep in mind, the right answer has a margin of error. They're looking for a coefficient of friction, static friction between 0.1 and 0.3. So as long as you're within that range, you're going to get the right answer. So don't be overly concerned with getting it perfect, perfect. And remember what we're trying to do here. We're trying to find spots along that average line that perfectly intersect the graph paper because those points are much more accurate compared to these experimental data points that are all individually subject to error. So there's a perfect intersection point right there. So I'm going to take my cursor. I'm lining up with it. I'm going to drop this line down and I'm looking for another perfect intersection point. There's my rise. And you see there's another perfect intersection point. And here comes my run. And that's exactly what we want. We want a rise over a run. We found it. Now, before I go on to find that slope, just realize we are done with C3. So if you look at C3, it said draw a line of best fit for the data graphed in part C2. Now we're finally on to part D. Calculate an experimental value from US using the best fit line you drew in figure three. So what I like to do is just count up the boxes. And look right here, we have 14 boxes. So I'm gonna put 14. And now I need to realize, I can't just put 14, I need to realize that each one of these boxes is worth 0 0.02 and our unit is meters. So done with that, let's check out the run. The run, one, two, three, that's five more. Hey, that's 10 boxes, that's pretty convenient. And those, 10 boxes are each valued at a value of 0.1. This ugly unit, which we already discussed, is just a what? Meter. Awesome. So what we have right here is some pretty easy math. Our meters would cancel out. And I'd say 14 times 0.02. Well, that would give me 0.28, right? Divided by, well, what's 10 times 0.1? Right? So 0.28 divided by 1. Oh my gosh, my coefficient of static friction is 0.28. And there is no unit. Very important to realize that. We are all done. 
All right, everybody. Done with another FRQ. I'm looking forward to doing the next one with you guys. Please like and subscribe. I'll talk with you soon.